Autoimmune blistering diseases and acne. Autoimmune blistering disorders are a group of skin disorders characterized by bullous lesions. They mainly involve uh, the skin and mucosal membranes with the formation of bulle and their pathogenesis is autoimmune. These diseases can be divided in two main groups according to their histological appearance, acantholytic and non-acantholytic. The most common disorder within the acantholytic subtype is pempigus, while the most common non-acantholytic disorder is pempigoid. Acantholysis is the loss of coherence adhesion between epidermal cells due to breakdown of the intercellular bridges. There are autoimmune conditions characterized by the presence of autoantibodies that target the bridges between keratinocytes, leading to loss of cellular connections. Therefore, cells remain intact but are no longer attached one to another, and due to, the lo to this loss of contact, they tend to gain around the, the surface, smallest surface area possible, and cause disruption of the tissue anatomy. This results in the permeation of trussulet liquid within the various layers and the formation of cleft vesicles and bulle. This image shows the basic structures responsible for cell cell adhesion. Some are intracellular, like desmoplakin and placoglobin, and some are transcellular, like desmoglein and desmocolin. These are desmosomal caterings that are cell adhesion molecules necessary for keratinocyte linkage. The intracellular molecules attach to the actin cytoskeleton. The extracellular molecules are the main targets of autoantibodies in these autoimmune disorders. Desmoglanes are the main target and in humans there are three different types. According to which specific one is targeted, a different disease arises, involving different layers of the skin. DG1 mainly affects the upper layers of the epidermis. This is why scales are more commonly detected rather than proper bulle, and is the major autoantigen in Pempigus foliaceus, DG1. DG DG2. It affects all tissues that possess desmosomes and are ext extremely rare forms. DG3, the main layers af affected are the basal and parabasal ones, causing the break of the ep derma dermal epidermal junction. The disease that arises is Pempigus vulgaris. Desmocolins are two main types, DC1 and DC2. They are the targets of another type of pempigus, known as subcorneal pustular des des dermatosis. Subcorneal pustular dermatosis, that is mediated by IgA and IgA antibodies. This is the exception because all other pempigus conditions are mediated by IgG. Pempigus is an autoimmune intraepithelial blistering disease affecting the skin and mucous membranes, mediated by autoantibodies directed against desmoglanes. They are mostly IgG antibodies that cause acantholysis, loss of cell cell adhesion. This is Pempigos classification with four main categories that can be further subdivided in various forms. The paraneoplastic Pempigos seems to be related to some kind of resemblance between cancer antigens and desmosome components. From a clinical point of view, they can be divided into a deep type, where we have 100% of mucosal involvement. Uh, the SG3 is found in mucosal membranes, and the main forms are Pempigus vulgaris and Pempigus vegetans. So we have production of new tissue for unknown reasons, and we have superficial types. No, uh, or rare where we have no or rare mucosal involvement. DGS, DSG1 is not found in the mucosal membranes. In Pempigus foliaceus and Pempigus uh, erythematosus. So, Pempigus vulgaris and Pempigus vegetans are of the deep type. And uh, while Pempigus foliaceus and Pempigus erythematosus are part of the superficial shell types, we, so we see here Pempigus vulgaris can be Pempigus vegetans localized or drug induced, 
Pemphigus foliaceus can be Pemphigus erythematosus, Fugo selvagem, or drug induced. Then we have also paranoplastic Pemphigus and IgA Pemphigus. This is Pemphigus vulgaris, and looking at this histology section, you can see acantholysis in the deep structures with involvement of dermal papillae. On the skin, you can detect bullet, or more often the broken bullet that appear as excoriations or crusts. This, on the other hand, is Pemphigus foliaceus, and you can detect the difference of the layers involved on the histology section. The basal layer is no longer involved, but, but rather mainly the keratin layer of the skin. Due to such superficial involvement, often one can detect scales rather than bullet on the patient's skin. Epidemiology. It's a rare disorder that occurs worldwide. With a variable incidence that varies from 0.3 to 0.5 cases per 100,000, there is an increased incidence in Ashkenazi Jews and individuals of Mediterranean origin. Male to female ratio is approximately equal, and the mean age of onset of the disease is around 30 60 years. Etiology and pathogenesis. The underlying cause is unknown, however, some environmental factors have been considered as, predis as predisposing factors such as infectious agents and drugs. Also, genetic, pre genetic predisposition is present, mainly involving MSC class 2 molecules, especially HLA-DRW4 and HLA-DRW6. So, overall, the sequence of events seems to be immune system dysregulation that leads to uncontrolled B-cell expansion and the generation of autoantibodies that are pathogenetic. This is extremely relevant because it has led to the development of new possible treatments for these conditions, such as anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies against memory B cells, decreasing the titer of autoantibodies and therefore making clinical manifestations less severe. The deposition of autoantibodies can be detected by direct or indirect immunofluorescence. However, some new data regarding pathogenesis states that the detachment of cell is Cells is not only related to binding of, -antibod of antibodies to desmoglein and their steric hindrance, but also related to the activation of keratinocytes by the antigen antibody complex. The activation of keratinocytes causes further activation of the UPA system, the urokinase plas plasminogen activator, that triggers transformation of plasminogen into plasmin, and there also seems to play a major role in loss of cell contact. Prognosis. Pemphigus is potentially a life-threatening disease, especially when it involves large areas of the skin, due to loss of proteins and liquids and potential risk of superinfection, and when, not, and when it occurs in older patients. The mortality rate is approximately 5 to 15%, and treatment was unsatisfactory until some years ago, when anti-CD20 Antibody, when uh, anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies were introduced. Now we will analyze them more in deep depth uh, all the various conditions. Pemphigus vulgaris is a subtype of Pemphigus, characterized by autoantibodies uh, anti-DSG3 uh, and uh, affects deep locations within the skin. It is not clear why these patients only have certain areas of the skin that are involved, even though it is a systemic disease. Also, mucosal lesions may precede cutaneous lesions by month, and these have to be promptly recognized. Especially in mucosal membranes, lesions appear as erosions rather, rather than bullet. They are easily, easily destroyed due to friction. They are extremely painful and are very slow in the healing process. These ill-defined and irregularly shaped erosions can be gingival, buccal or palatine, and they tend to extend peripherally. This can be demonstrated via specific tests. Also, other mucosal surfaces may be involved, such as larynx, hoarseness, esophagus, conjunctiva, labia, vagina, cervix, penis, ultra, uretra and anus. The reason early detection is important is because these lesions can lead to scarring and, and in certain areas it can be a very dangerous complication like conjunctiva or urethra. 
This is how lesions appear in the oral mucosa and what you see are erosions, not really bulle. On the skin, Pempigus vulgaris lesions are flaccid, fluid-filled blisters with clear fluid that arise mainly on a normal skin. Blisters are rather fragile, therefore erosions are commonly detected. Also, erosions tend to be quite large because of their tendency to extend peripherally with the shedding of epithelium. Lesions can be found either as few small sparse blisters or they can be bigger and come to coalesces on the skin surface, causing massive erosions as in the picture on the right. Clinical signs There are some clinical signs associated with acantholysis that can raise the suspicion of such diseases. We have Nikolsky sign, which is a sign elicited by, elicited by applying tangential pressure with a finger on the affected skin, perilisional skin or normal skin. It's considered positive if there is extension of the blister, removal of epidermis in the rubbed area or if a new blister arises. This occurs because traction and friction on the skin causes enhanced detachment of the skin layers, since the cell cell adhesions are very weak and fragile. Also, keep in mind that this test can be done also on normal appearing skin because the disease is systemic and therefore affects the entire body surface. Skin, are area, skin areas that appear normal and healthy in reality are not. And we have also bulla spread sign, also known as Asboe Hansen sign. We have an enlargement of an intact blister with application of mechanical pressure on its roof. This occurs due to mechanical pressure on the blister fluid that causes peripheral enlargement, generally with a sharp angle. Note that the skin surrounding the bulla is not inflamed, with no redness. However, when bulla rupture and become erosions, there is associated inflammation of the surrounding tissues. Nails On the nails, bulla can also develop under the nails or on the tip of fingers leading to characteristic appearance seen in the picture. Acute paronychia, subungual hematomas and nail dystrophies can arise. Pempigus vegetans is a specific form of Pempigus vulgaris. In some patients, 1-2%, following bull erosions, there is the development of excessive granulation tissue, so proliferation of blood vessels to allow for tissue repair, and prominent crusting that appears as vegetating lesions. This is overall an excess of the attempt to repair the eroded tissue. These lesions tend to develop in specific areas of the body, more commonly folds, scalp and face, and also seem to be more resistant to therapy. Upon histologic examination, acantholysis is accompanied by diffuse and irregular hyperplasia of the epithelium and the large dermal papillae, infiltrated by eosinophils, neutrophils and plasma cells. The presence of eosinophils inflammatory cells is one of the main mechanisms to differentiate pempigus vegetans from vulgaris. So we have presence of eosinophils inflammatory cells, which distinguishes it from pempigus vulgaris. Pempigus foliaceus. These lesions are rather rare, rare in our geographic regions. As already said, IgGs develop against a superficial epidermal so there's desmosomal antigen, the DSG1, and therefore acantholysis affects the subcorneal regions and does not involve the mucosal layers. In these patients, blisters are rare, and more commonly the lesions that develop are exfoliative and rarely very superficial erosions with mild crusting. They, these are the typical superficial lesions with silver white, scale, white scales and no mucosal involvement, therefore also less blood vessel involvement. Bull in general are not painful. Generally pain arises when, er when erosions develop. We have also Pempigus erythematosus. It's a subtype of Pempigus foliaceus, its more localized form and is also referred to as Senior Usher syndrome is the second most frequent form of pempigus after pempigus vulgaris and it's also the less severe form. The lesions typically develop in sun-exposed areas 
and have a very strong resemblance with discoid lesions of lupus erythematosus, and in some cases may also be similar to seborrheic dermatitis. These two are the main differential diagnoses, and differentiation can be very tricky sometimes. Diagnosis can be made only with histology specimens. Cantolysis is easily detected. Sometimes a clue could be the scaling that can, detect, can be detected on top of the erythematous base. In this picture, a kind of peeling can be detected in the nose, and this is generally not present in the other two conditions. Treatment. The aim of treatment is in Pempigus vulgaris is to decrease blister formation, promote healing of blister and erosions, and determine minimal dose of medication necessary to control disease process. Pempigus vulgaris is mainly treated with immunosuppressant therapy. On the other hand, Pempigus foliaceus is treated less aggressively because it is a less severe and not a life-threatening condition. We can use corticosteroids like prednisone, 1.5 mg per kilogram per day, which can be tapered if the condition improves and if divided doses are administered, they have a major anti-inflammatory effect. We have also immunosuppressive agents, generally used as adjuvants in Pempigus vulgaris patients that do not respond to steroids. The main agents administered are azathioprine, 1 mg per kilogram per day, cyclophosphamide, IVAGs, which decrease the titer of circulating, circulating out antibodies, and rituximab, so anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. We have paranoplastic pempigus, which is a condition, rare condition, but it can be more easily seen in a subclass of cancer patients, such as non-Hodgkin lymphoma, leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, Castelman tumor, which is a tumor of lymph nodes, or thymomas. It is generally not found associated to squamocellular carcinoma or adenocarcinoma. The mechanism by which they occur seems to be related to development of cross-reaction between tumor antigens and desmosomal antigens. Clinical presentation. Femfigus resembles the vulgaris type and is characterized by severe persistent painful stomatitis extending from the lips to the pharynx, larynx and esophagus. There can also be conjunctival involvement with an increased risk of blindness and some cutaneous changes, such as erythematous macules, papules, blisters and erosions. Treatment. Treatment of the underlying tumor is the first step and prognosis strongly correlates to the response of the patient to cancer therapy. There is no general consensus regarding the immunosuppressive regimen to employ, also because they are cancer patients. Therefore, all is discussed with oncologists. But recent reports have shown good success in patients treated with anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies, so rituximab. Pemphigoid. These disorders are, are quite peculiar. They are non acantholytic and mainly affect only the skin. We have bullus pemphigoid, which is the most common autoimmune bullus disease, mainly affecting the elderly, or at least uh, there is a great increase in the risk of developing the disease as age increases, and there's no ethnic, racial, or sexual predilection. The incidence is approximately 14, 47, uh, 472 per 1 million per year. It is an autoimmune disorder without antibodies directed against two amidosmosomal proteins, BP230 and BP antigen 1, and BP180, BP antigen 2. However, the mechanism is slightly, slightly different because the binding of autoantibodies leads to complement, to complement activation, recruitment of eosinophils, mainly but also neutrophils that are activated and release important amounts of proteases that cause the disruption and separation of skin layers between the epidermis and the dermis. Therefore, these autoantibodies do not cause acantholysis, but only trigger inflammation. So no acantholysis, but only inflammation. 
clinical presentation. The main difference with respect to pemphigus is that blisters develop on an inflamed and redness skin, not on a normal appearing skin area. Therefore, often, before the formation of blisters, there can be development of dermatitis, urticarial lesions, pruritus, linked to histamine release by eosinophils, or related to strong inflammatory reaction. Blisters tend to be tense, with fluid levels and can become rather big, reaching 10 cm in diameter. They are most commonly located on the lower abdomen, tides and forearms, and mucosal involvement is seen in only 20% of patients. When you see images like this on the right, you are sure the patient cannot have pemphigus because of the marked inflammation of the skin. From the histological point of, uh, point of view, the main characteristic is the presence of large amount of eosinophils, even though two different forms can be identified. We have a rich form, which contains many, many eosinophils and neutrophils, and we have a cell poor form, which only has a sparse infiltrate. The blister is generally found subepidermal, therefore at the junction between the dermal papillae, floor of, floor of the blister, and the keratinocyte layer of the epidermis, so roof of the, of the blister. If, if you look at the image on the right, you make and make a comparison with the slides of the pemphigus, you can see the massive amount of inflammatory infiltrates in these patients. Diagnosis is mainly done, made by, via immunopathology, especially direct and indirect immunofluorescence. Direct immunofluorescence detects presence of IgGs and C3. This complement is another very relevant aspect of this disease along the basement membrane zone. Indirect immunofluorescence is also used. Autoantibodies can be detected either on the roof or on the floor of the blister, or both. The autoantibodies can be detected via ELISA. Also, these patients have increased ESR due to systemic inflammation, eosinophilia due to recruitment and activation, and an increase in IgE. Therapy. The mainstay of treatment is the use of systemic corticosteroids, like prednisolone, but some, st some steroid sparing agents can be considered as and used. We have azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate, mofetil, methotrexate, and overall, the therapy for all these conditions is similar. We have also secret cicatricial pemphigoid. As it's a subtype of pemphigoid, another rare disorder with a slight female predominance and mainly affected individuals in their 60s. Clinical presentation is it's characterized by the development of scars and this can be rather worrisome depending on the organ involved and the location. Conjunctiva is affected in 75% of cases. It starts unilaterally but progresses to bilateral involvement rather quickly. That is within two years. The main lesions are adi adhesions, ectropion and corneal damage. We can have also involvement of the oral mucosa which is affected in 75% of cases with the formation of vesicles, blisters, erosions, and scarring. In some cases, also the squamative gingivitis can develop. It is less painful than pemphigus vulgaris. It can also esophagus and larynx, larynx can be involved with formation of strictures, genitalia. In women, there can be narrowing of the vaginal orifice, while in males, the, there can be the formation of adhesions between the glands and the foreskin can also have involvement of the rectal mucosa and the skin, which is affected in 25% of cases, usually generalized, usually generalized, and appears very similar to bullus pemphigoid. There can also be a localized form, known as bursting peri disease, in which there is the formation of recurrent blisters on top of persistent plaques. Upon histological examination, one can detect subepidermal blisters with prominent inflammatory infiltrates, especially neutrophils and eosinophils. When older lesions are examined, one generally sees a sample that is poor in cells and predominantly characterized by fibroblast proliferation and development of lamellar fibrosis. The reason why such prominent scary develops is completely unknown. Diagnosis 
once again, immunofluorescence is the mechanism of choice. Both a direct and indirect immunofluorescence can be used, and it is relevant to know that IgGs can be found also in apparently healthy areas of the skin. Remember that it's a systemic disease. Therefore, one can perform biopsy and examination of areas of the skin not involved by lesions and still be capable of making a diagnosis. In some occasions, IgMs and IgAs can also be detected, and generally, when IgGs and IgAs are found concomitantly, the patient has a worse prognosis. Therapy can be divided depending on moderate or severe involvement of the organs. If we have moderate involvement, we do local care, dapsone, and prednisone. If we have severe involvement, we do local care, prednisone, and uh, intravenous immunoglobulins. Also consider the use of azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, mofetil, uh, mofetil, uh, mycophenolate mofetil, and rituximab. We have also gestational pemphigoid which is another subtype of pemphigoid that occurs during pregnancy. It's common for some autoimmune diseases to appear during gestation. It seems to be related to cross-reaction between placental antigens and demidesmosomal proteins. Sensitization of the mother to specific placental antigens could be related to expression of specific haplotypes, like HLA-B8, HLA-DR3 and HLA-DR4, and possibly by the father of haplotype HLA-DR2. This condition is not very common. We have one in 10,000, 50,000 pregnancies. It has no maternal risk and no increased risk of birth defects. However, if the same father is maintained, there is a very high likelihood of recurrence in subsequent pregnancies. It can lead to complications of pregnancy in 15-30% of cases and possibly fetal death in 8% of cases. Clinical presentation. Blisters tend to appear associated um, to prominent pruritus in the second third trimester and persist until delivery. They rarely appear postpartum. The most common sites are the abdomen and the extremities mucosal involvement only seen in 20% of cases and they tend to resolve within three months. They may recur with menses or with the intake of oral contraceptives and tend to be worse in following pregnancies. IgGs can cross the placenta. Therefore, in some cases, babies can be born with blisters which will resolve in three, six months. They are acquired from the mother. They are not endogenously produced by the baby. Therefore, it will only be a temporary disorder. IgAs are the only antibodies that pass with milking, while IgGs can be passed to the child only during the third trimester and delivery. Therapy. Topical corticosteroids are considered ineffective. Prednisolone, uh, half of half a milligram per kilogram per day, can be administered, but there is the risk of causing gestational diabetes. In several cases, one can consider IVIGs or cyclosporine or azathioprine. They can be used during pregnancy, while cyclosporine and metrotrexate cannot be used because they are very teratogenic. We have also dermatitis herpetiformis, which is an autoimmune blistering disorder associated with gluten sensitive enteropathy, therefore, the cutaneous manifestation of celiac disease. Pathophysiology. Gluten is a protein present in barley, rye, and wheat, and these individuals tend to have sensitivity leads to the formation of IgA antibodies to gluten tissue transglutaminases found in the gut, and this can then cross-react with epidermal transglutaminases. This causes the position of IgA uh, transglutaminase complexes in the papillary dermis, which triggers an immunologic cascade, resulting in neutrophil recruitment, activation, and complement uh, activation. The blisters are not due to acantholysis, but to inflammation related to immune complex deposition. Also, these patients have a strong association with specific HLA haplotypes. 
90% of patients with HLA-DQ2 and 10% with HLA-DQ8. Clinical presentation characterized by vesicles blisters that develop on an erythematous skin, and this can undergo rupture to form erosions or grouped excoriations. It's extremely pruritic. In fact, the hallmark of the disease is the presence of intensely pruritic or burning tiny vesicles, usually scratched away. There are specific areas where lesions tend to develop, such as elbows, knees, buttocks, and the back. In some cases, these skin lesions allow for diagnosis of celiac disease. From the histologic point of view, Microalvices can be detected in the, in the papillary dermis, mainly rich in neutrophils but often admixed with eosinophils. It's a lifelong disease, like celiac disease, although periods of exacerbation and remission are common. These patients have to avoid gluten for life and this leads, leads to resolution of intestinal manifestations together with skin manifestations. Diagnosis is made detecting neutrophil accumulations at the dermoepithelial junction and by using direct immunofluorescence to detect IgA in a glandular pattern in the upper papillary dermis. Treatment is with strict gluten-free diet, Dapson and um, Cosikin, Cyclosporin, Azathioprine and Prednisone are second-line agents. So, strict gluten-free diet and Dapson, even if in Italy it's not commercially available. Acne vulgaris. It's a chronic inflammatory disease of the pilocybaceous follicles that give rise to characteristic lesions called the comedons, together with more typical ones like papules, pustules, cysts, nodules, and scars. The trigger of the release is mainly related to hormonal levels, therefore it is typically a disease of adolescence affects 90% of all teenagers and tend to resolve, tends to resolve in the late 20s, at 25-30 years. It mainly occurs in all seborrheic areas of the skin, therefore the face, especially cheeks, nose and forehead, neck, retroauricular and nuca, ears, conca, upper trunk and upper arms. Comedo, also known as blackhead, is the basic lesion of acne. It arises in her follicles and after the loss of the hair, there is hyperkeratosis of the lining of the follicle, causing closure of the follicle. This is why it appears black. However, this closure leads to retention of keratin and sebum that forms the perfect environment for a superinfection by bacteria. These proliferate and produce free fatty acids, which are chemotactic for inflammatory cells that cause inflammation and overall lead to the formation of a sebum-filled infected pustule, also known as whitehead. Keep in mind that the hyperproduction of sebum is mainly caused by androgen stimulation. Therefore, always consider hyperandrogenic states in women that present with very prominent acne, like PCO, like uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, or 21 beta hydroxylase deficiency. The main hormone to exert effects on the sebaceous gland is the hydral, uh, the hydral and the hydrotestosterone. The main bacterium responsible for superinfection of her follicle is Propionibacterium acne, acnes that metabolizes sebum to produce free fatty acids. At histology, acne is characterized by perifollicular inflammation around comedons with prominent exudates of lymphocytes and polymorphonuclear cells, together with proliferation of plasma cells and fibroblasts. There are different types of acne. We have acne comedo, which in mild cases with eruptions mainly localized to, to seborrheic areas. We have papular acne with inflammatory papules in men with coarse, oily skin. We have atrophic acne with residual atrophic pits and scars. Some things should be considered when visiting patients with acne. Sex, age, menstrual history and medications. So corticosteroids, oral contraceptives or anabolic steroids. Severity of the acne should also be assessed. We have typical mild acne where comedons predominate. In more severe cases, pustules and papules predominate. And if rather deep, they can heal, leaving a scar. We have also acne conglobata, 
where suppurative cystic lesions predominate, leading to prominent and severe scarring. Acne conglobata is a severe form of acne characterized by numerous comedons that tend to coalesce and form large abscesses with sinuses and, pro and prominent inflammatory nodules. They are greatly suppurated and form rounded mass or balls that can even be bigger than one centimeter. They are mainly found on the forehead, cheeks and neck. Young men are more frequently affected with a specific triad. Acne conglobata, hydroadenitis suppurativa and cellulitis of the scalp. Lesions are so deep and big that healing results in formation of large scars. Treatment is oral isotretinoin for 5 months. Levoso acne fulminans, which is an even more severe form of acne, very rare, characterized by extremely severe cystic degeneration that causes the formation of nodules that easily ulcerate. It mainly affects young boys, generally on the chest or on the back, and it, and it is typically accompanied by systemic signs like fever, leukocytosis, or other tragedies. Therapy is, is with oral steroids and isotretinoin. isotretinoin. We have also SAPO syndrome, which is synovitis, seronegative spondylar properties. Acne, pustulosis, hyperostosis with increased bone density and osteomyelitis, so bone inflammation. It's a syndrome of unknown origin characterized by the concomitant appearance of all these manifestations, including acne. Acne can be fulminance, conglobata, or also postular, psoriasis, or palmoplantar pustulosis. Treatment of acne. There is no evidence that dietary habits influence the development of acne, therefore you can eat all the chocolate you want. Treatment can be both topical and systemic medications. The mainstay of therapy is the use of antibacterials. We have tetracyclines, which are the safest and cheapest choice, can be administered constantly or at intermittent pulses for months to years. They give a positive response to 70% of individuals. Prolonged antibiotic therapy can cause fungal infections, candida especially, and they should be avoided in children less than 9 years of age because it does cause yellow discoloration of teeth. We have minocycline, which is more effective in acne vulgaris and its absorption is not affected by food or milk. We have oral contraceptives. So estradiol suppresses the uptake of testosterone by sebaceous glands. However, when oral contraceptives are rich in androgenic progesterones, they may exacerbate acne. We have isotretinoin, which is a derivative of retinoids and exerts its effects via two main nuclear receptors, RARS and increased comedogenesis and also decreased inflammatory component. We have also tropical, topical treatments, which can be used in more limited forms of acne and can be topical retinoids, topical antibacterials, salicylic acid, which is anti-inflammatory, and benzoyl peroxide, which is a peeling agent that increases skin turnover, keeps pore clean and decreases bacterial count. Complications. Scarring can occur when lesions are extremely deep, despite best treatment. In some cases also, keloids can develop. One can try to improve these aesthetic problems with laser therapy or scan ex scar excision.